It's my deeply held belief, dear viewer, that the best YouTube channels don't pander to trends and algorithms, but instead put out the videos they want to make. Kind of like SNL, I think if you write stuff you find interesting, other folks will find it interesting as well. That's what I've tried to do these first few months, and it's what I'll keep trying to do as I go forward. That said, I'm not stupid. The internet loves its list videos, its top 10 videos, its best ofs and worst ofs. I watch them too, not gonna lie. So I figure I'll do one of those per season, just to feed the beast, and then I'll get back to business as usual. I'm totally making up the format as I go, by the way, so I hope you enjoy it. You may think it's strange to start a video like this with the best of the year, because that doesn't leave you anything to build towards. Frankly, I've often found the worst bits, the ones that were ill-conceived or bewilderingly executed, the most entertaining parts making these videos, so I'm going to start at the top and work my way down from there. My top three episodes, then, in no particular order. Buck Henry's second performance should have closed the season, but they were a big hit that couldn't quit by that point, so they crammed in three more increasingly disappointing efforts after this one. It seems to me like the writers really figured out early on how to write for Buck, because most of the strongest bits in this episode feature him heavily. This one is a winner, almost front to back, with only one real sticker of a sketch. I can't explain why I like this one so much. The sketches aren't wildly inventive, and Desi shouldn't work as a host. Somehow I find myself grinning like an idiot throughout most of this one, though, and there's one other thing as well. Probably because of the interest in the recently released biopic about him and Lucy, my video on this episode inexplicably sort of blew up. It has 30 times the views of any other video I've ever made, and I credit that weird bump for getting the channel off the ground, so thanks, Desi. It shouldn't come as any surprise that the guy who's probably the funniest host of the season has one of the best shows as well. Carlin's debut episode was too packed to the gills and full of panic sweat to be in serious contention. Pryor's show is strong mostly on the back of his own performance, with everybody else sort of just there to back him up. Normally I wouldn't be a fan of that sort of thing, and it's not how SNL would work going forward, but this episode has too many great moments to ignore. These are the worst overall shows. They all have bad hosts, but I think it's worth noting that a bad host doesn't always make for a bad episode. I don't think Peter Boyle, for instance, was particularly funny in his appearance, but that show wasn't painful to watch like the ones we're about to mention. I mean, this kind of has to be mentioned first just to get it out of the way. Hastily and obviously thrown together on the insistence of some suits somewhere at NBC, this debacle and the other Midsummer episode were a failed mistake that would never again be repeated. The Lasser show is by far the worst of the two, though, down to Lasser's bonkers antics and bizarre fixation on herself and her own recent showbiz travails. I referred to this one as listless and hard to talk about in my video, and that's what it is. Almost nothing noteworthy happens during this one. I personally find Diane Cannon annoying, and as I type this, I can only remember one sketch, the terrible Johnny Angels thing, and I hated it. It's not fun to watch a show when it's obvious that the people on the show aren't enjoying themselves. Ms. Welch seemed joyless throughout. Everybody other than Danny has zero chemistry with her, and her insistence on singing poorly on more than one occasion is the final straw. Perhaps the only SNL better watched on mute. The musical guests in season one are ridiculously varied in genre, so much so that any ranking of them is going to be largely a matter of my own personal taste in music. It's worth noting that I myself play acoustic guitar and listen mostly to rock and folk music, so my tastes lean in that direction. Your mileage may vary in this category more so than perhaps any other. It's almost cheating for Paul to make this list because he got to play two or three times as much material as any other musical guest in the season. Still though, it wouldn't be fair to ignore what a big deal the Simon and Garfunkel reunion was to the early publicity surrounding the show, and all of Simon's performances are note for note pristine. I maintain, however, that he is a terrible basketball player with a bad 70s haircut. I'm kind of obsessed with Leon Redbone now, and he's definitely the guest I'm most pleased to have learned about watching the first season. Leon is a completely unique entity in the annals of popular music, and I look forward to the rest of his appearances with great anticipation. Jimmy Cliff is undoubtedly the best part of the otherwise kind of flat episode he was in. He got a wild round of applause after his second number, and he gave me literal chills to the extent I wrote it down in my notes when it happened. I'd say that qualifies him for the list. I'm not a big fan of reggae, but I enjoyed all three of his cuts and actually picked up the soundtrack to The Harder They Come. I guess that's an endorsement. 
My only note about these is that I've exempted hosts from this category, even if they were among the musical guests on their show or the sole musical guest in the case of Lily Tomlin. Suffice it to say that had I not, the hosts would have swept the category. When you start off your performance on Saturday Night Live by screwing up the chords to your song and asking if you could start over, you make this list. These are the rules I've just made up. Honestly, once John Sebastian gets going, his performance of this embarrassing TV song isn't awful, but he's here on principle. This one's completely subjective, mind you, but I didn't find much to enjoy in Betty Carter's aimless jazz crooning, technically impressive as it was. I also can't imagine it being a hit with literally anybody in SNL's audience of hip 18 to 34 year olds, so that's another strike against it. Still though, nothing against Carter, she was pretty badass. I am cheating just a little here. These two appeared on the same night and were opposite sides of the same terrible coin. ABBA's technically proficient but slickly professional lip-syncing clashed mightily with the rebellious spirit the live program sought to project, whereas Loudon Wainwright's inexplicable rage and raggedly amateurish performance were off-putting on a whole other level. Whoever the show was trying to impress by having these two guests, they missed on both marks. Points for variety, but that's about it. These are not necessarily the three best sketches of the season. I purposely omitted the really well-known stuff that makes appearances on best of compilations and anniversary specials in favor of the less recognized pieces featuring the not ready for prime timers that stood out to me personally. We all know Danny's Bassomatic and Garrett's Kill All the Whiteys are great. These are a few you might not know as well. This is an example of Gilda being adorable and Danny just playing the straight man, but in an oddly entertaining way you can't help but love. I don't know why this one works so well for me, but it was the first thing that came to mind when I started writing this category. I love the authenticity of this one. The language is perfect, totally believable as teen talk. I've never been a teenage girl, of course, but I certainly hung around with enough of them as a teenager to know how very accurate this whole thing is. I love seeing all three of the ladies on stage at once, and Madeline Kahn is great with them. This one stands out as a season highlight for Jane in a year when she played a whole lot of talk show hosts and interviewers and not much else. Both she and Gilda are wonderful here. The length is just about right, and I absolutely adore Jane's network TV appropriate bondage outfit. <laughs> Leather's a nice look on you, Jane. These are just bad. They were bad ideas to begin with, they were executed poorly, and they should not have been aired. It's very easy to say things like this with confidence in hindsight. I'm quite certain that when you have a deadline to meet, otherwise you got dead air, there comes a point in the week when you just run with whatever stupid idea pops in your head, and I can't really blame anybody for that. Regardless, these sketches suck. First of all, too long. There's very little on SNL that ever needs to approach the 10 minute mark. That goes doubly so for a dippy parody of terrible made for TV movies. This contains a graphic depiction of a near rape, and that barely even qualifies as the worst part of the sketch. Truly dire, this one. I think I kind of nailed it when I said awful community theater caliber Drek in my Diane Cannon video. As a bonus, this dumb premise almost led to everyone's death at the hands of the actual Hells Angels who showed up at the studio the following week, none too pleased about their depiction. Valuable lesson learned then, I suppose. The sketch that birthed an entire season of me bitching about Lily Tomlin's singing voice. I think it stumbles at the first hurdle, honestly. I got the distinct impression the audience didn't understand the premise, despite the Patty Hearst trial being all over the papers at the time. Perhaps it wasn't general knowledge that Hearst had been a sorority sister, but for whatever reason, this one failed on every level. It just was not entertaining. Boo. Bad sketch. Boo. Bad. I don't pretend to know why certain clothes and hairstyles are fashionable at any given moment in time, or why they go out of style and are replaced by others. I've read that fashion is cyclical though, so here's hoping none of these fashions will be enjoying a resurgence anytime soon. To paraphrase Top Gear's James May, the 70s was a very brown decade. Now I have no problem with earthy tones, but I think you'd have to look pretty hard to find a garment with that choice of colors these days. I know this is all very subjective, but I don't think anybody'd wear that in 2020-something. 
The most spellbinding and least bra-wearing participant in SNL's debut, certainly, Cyrita Wright reminds me of some kind of badass gypsy bohemian warrior dancer or something. The whole band is a sight to behold, really, but something about Wright's flowing dress and head wrap just steal the show. I love it. I mean, just look at all that denim. I'm, I'm, I'm speechless. So I think I've picked the worst things of any variety that happened on the show the entire first season. These are the sorts of mind-boggling decisions that got made despite objections from Lorne or the network or basic decency or common sense. However, only one can take the dubiously coveted crown. And to tell you the truth, I knew it had won the moment I laid eyes on it. Three runners up first. This painfully padded waste of film is seven minutes of a Grammy-winning acoustic guitarist playing pickup basketball against a professional player twice his size. I felt my mustache get longer while watching this film, but at least it doesn't actively offend the senses. Which is more than I can say about this unpleasant lump of a sketch, in which beloved British comedy institutions Peter Cook and Dudley Moore are reduced to a humiliated cross-dressing punchline. It's astonishingly bad, and I'm sort of embarrassed for them when I watch it. They deserved better. Everything that could be wrong with this is wrong with it. It's too long, offensively broad, not funny, and has an annoying catchphrase. Can you dig it? I knew that you could. Yeah. Boy, I sure can't wait for this guy to join the cast in a few years. But the winner of the quad for season one should come as no surprise to any of you who've been watching these past few weeks. I'd be surprised if you hadn't guessed it already, really. Our first lifetime achievement for sucking on SNL goes to Louise Lasser for her brain-bendingly solipsistic A Film by Louise Lasser, in which she sits at a diner table with poor Alan's Weibel and stubbornly refuses to be an actress and, you know, read lines and shit. It's an honestly bewildering display, and I think the fact they bothered to air it at all was down strictly to wanting to make her look bad in retaliation for the week of hell Lassard put them all through. I'm sure that there will be plenty of other things that boggle my mind by their inclusion in an episode of SNL, but I can't imagine any of them can truly top this as an example of something that would, under no circumstances, been broadcast by sane people. I've run out of superlative ways to say it's really, really bad, so I guess I'll just leave it there. It's really, really bad. Thank you again to all of my viewers and subscribers. If for some reason you're watching this, but not subscribed, I would greatly appreciate it. I hope to eventually monetize this channel, but I have to hit a certain viewership threshold before that can happen. For now, though, it's on to Seasons 2 and beyond, so stay tuned.